In the mid-70s, the Pittsburgh Steelers established themselves as pro football's dominant team. In 1974 and 75, the Steelers won back-to-back -back Super Bowls on the strength of a basic formula, power running and punishing defense. You always want to get to that big game and play in the Super Bowl. Once you want it, it becomes contagious. You want more and more and more. There was a mindset in the team that we were the best, and there was nobody really even close to us. I mean, we were frighteningly good. Though the Steelers failed to reach the Super Bowl in 1976 and 77, their defense was still dominant, and the NFL changed rules to help open up offenses. In 1977, defensive linemen could no longer use head slaps at the line of scrimmage. More significantly, in 1978, the league imposed a rule that would impact the play of cornerbacks like number 47, Mel Blunt. Blunt was a premier cover man who punished opponents in the open field. He's a physical specimen at that time. He was huge. Oh, I just pitied those receivers as I was watching them go up against Mel. Football's a physical game, and well, it used to be anyway. And, and so, one of the things that I always wanted to do was let people know that this is my territory. If you come in here, you're going to have to pay. Prior to 1978, defensive backs have been able to jam receivers downfield. Under the new rule, defenders could only make contact with receivers within five yards of the line of scrimmage. The rule forever changed the passing game in the NFL. It became known as the Mel Blunt rule. They really was trying to legislate the game to slow the Steelers down, especially on defense, because we were basically dominating the game. I think any time a player can have such an effect on the game that they name a rule after you, I think it's an honor, and, and it's something that my kids can read about, and, and so it, it's a part of your legacy, and, and I'm honored that they thought enough of the way I played the game that they would change the rule and call it the Mel Blunt rule. Defensive backs today, they probably look at me and say, man, that's the guy there right there that's causing us so many problems today. The new rules would have a huge impact on the team in 1978. In fact, the Steelers would never be the same they would be better than ever. Entering 1978, the NFL rule changes that could have hurt the Steelers' defense actually did more to help the Pittsburgh offense. When they changed the rules, the Steelers adjusted their offense and really went more from a power run game to an air attack. And uh, Bradshaw had a field day. Quarterback Terry Bradshaw got off to the best start of his career. He threw a pair of touchdowns in each of the first three games, and the Steelers rolled to a 3-0 record. Bradshaw backs up. Bradshaw's very deep now. Now he lets it fly to the end zone. There's Thornton for the touchdown. Straight down the middle to Sidney Thornton in the end zone. Here's Bradshaw going back deep. They're coming after him, chasing him out of the pocket, running to the left, and he fires downfield into the crowd. Cunningham makes a catch over the shoulder of the defensive back. Can you believe that? 
that rule change in 78 made a significant difference. It was very obvious, the difference in the releases that the wide receivers were getting and how quickly they could get into the field and create separation. Receivers John Stallworth and number 88 Lynn Swan were running free like never before. And even a lesser known tight end was consistently finding open spaces. Number 84, Randy Grossman, was a former undrafted free agent out of Temple University who found a place alongside Pittsburgh's more celebrated pass catchers. My first year being 74, we had a phenomenal draft that year. I mean, four guys are Hall of Fame guys. Two of the guys were Swan and Stallworth. I was obviously the runt of the litter, but uh, my mindset was there was no way that I was not going to make this team. I felt that the National Football League made a significant mistake in, in not drafting me, and I was going to show them what a big error they made. I mean, I was a mini tight end, even for back then. I was 6'2 and barely 215 pounds. I never had any doubt that I wouldn't be able to perform. But I think in the coaches' minds and the scouting department's mind, they always want you know, the package and they always want better. I played eight years. During that eight years, I think they drafted uh, around 10 tight ends. <laughs> so I guess they didn't have the same confidence in me that I had in them. In 1976, Pittsburgh drafted 6'5", 250-pound tight end Benny Cunningham in the first round. In 1978, Cunningham was off to his best start. Meyer, Meyer reverses it to Swan. He gives it back to Bradshaw. Bradshaw fired for Cunningham. Cunningham's game-winning score improved the Steelers to 4-0. Two weeks later, however, Cunningham was lost for the season with a knee injury. The starting job was left to Randy Grossman. The tight end the Steelers had always tried to replace turned into a player they couldn't do without. In just 10 starts, Grossman had a career-high 37 catches, the most by a Steelers tight end in over a decade. Randy Grossman, the little tight end, a basketball player at Temple. People were so concerned when Benny Cunningham went down, but their effectiveness has not changed since Grossman has come into the lineup. A typical Randy Grossman plays. He says, OK, Bradshaw, throw me the ball. I'll take whatever kind of a hit that guy can put on me. Grossman, the soft-spoken one, extremely articulate and extremely tough. The tough little tight end earned the not-so-tough nickname from his teammates. You know, you come from Philadelphia and you're Jewish. I mean, what kind of nickname are you going to get? I mean, they can't call you the Hebe, so what are they going to call you? The rabbi. So I was the rabbi. And, uh, and a couple times when I grew my beard, I looked pretty Hasidic, yeah. At that point in time, I've been the only Jewish player in the league. I think, actually, that's the only reason they kept me, you know, for <laughs> minority hiring or something. For the rabbi, the NFL was a promised land. And 1978 became a season of fulfillment. 78 was a great year, a really fun year for me. A player wants to play. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. It was really rewarding for me just to play. In 1978, Joe Green was still the heart and soul of the Steelers' defense. For years, Green had been the driving force behind the steel curtain. Now, he was a different player at the age of 32. Physically, in 78, I wasn't what I was in 74. Not as strong, not as, not as quick. But 78, I was a lot smarter. An older and wiser Joe Green was selected to his ninth Pro Bowl. And he became a mentor to Pittsburgh's young defenders. But you got to get, it's like three or four yards, you know? 
You just got to drive as deep as you can. Okay. And you still just stay in there with what you ought to do because he's giving off so much as to come down and rub it. Right, right. Rub it. Like I'm the defense filled with perennial all-pros was fortified with fresh talent. The young player who made the most significant impact was a second-year nickelback named Tony Dungy, number 21. He was a smart football player. In my 14 years in training camp, I had never seen the guy come through there who understood the game and knew the game of football the way Tony Dungy did. Dungy led the team with six interceptions, but the dominant force in the secondary was still ninth-year cornerback Mel Blunt. designed to neutralize him couldn't keep Blunt from another Pro Bowl season. I think when they changed those rules, it made me prove to the NFL that, you know, we still can play and we still be the best. But you got to have a positive attitude and you got to believe in yourself and believe in the people that you're working with. And uh, I think that was the kind of the mindset and the attitude that that whole team took on that we don't care what you do, we're going to still dominate. Pittsburgh adjusted its defense by blitzing more than ever. The Steelers gave up the fewest points in the NFL. In the regular season, they did not give up a touchdown in the first quarter. In week six, they recorded five sacks against the Falcons. And Rocky Blyer scored twice in a blowout win. And the give is to Blyer. Blyer over the right side. He's running for pay dirt. He's in the Flyers scored again the following week as the Steelers improved to 7-0, their best start ever. Flyer was having one of his best seasons at the age of 32. At times I find myself uh, sitting in front of my locker, you know, thanking God for giving me the opportunity to uh, be able to put this uniform on and to be able to play this game and to be able to make a living from it. It's hard to believe Blyer could ever make a living playing football. The running back was a 16th round draft choice out of Notre Dame in 1968. Near the end of his rookie season, he was drafted to fight in the Vietnam War. And so in a 24 hour period, I was a running back in the NFL to a uh, maggot in the United States Army, the lowest of the low. And my focus basically at that moment was, okay, fine, I guess I can be the best soldier I can be. In August of 1969, a grenade explosion left Blyer with serious wounds to his leg and foot. I was in Tokyo, and I asked the doctor whether I'd come back and play. Of course, he said, uh, no. Shortly thereafter, I got a postcard in the mail. Very simple, two lines, and it said, Rock, the team's not doing well. We need you. Art Rooney. You have somebody take the time and interest to send you a postcard, something that he didn't have to do. You, know, you have a special place for those, those kind of people. One year after he was wounded, Blyer reported to Steelers training camp. When he came back, he could barely walk. We watched Rocky work his tail off to get back on that football field. You'd always see him in the weight room. He was always working out. Why is he doing that? This guy can't play football. One day, Rocky was laying on the bench in the training room, and he had his shorts on, but Rocky was purple in his chest, in his hips, and his thighs, and bruises. And Rocky practiced that day. And that left an impression on me that I just never forgot, that if he could practice with his body looking like that, and I'm sure feeling the way he was looking, then we all got to practice. Blyer worked two full years trying to regain a spot on the Steelers' active roster. He spent most of 1971 on the practice squad, but wouldn't give up on his NFL dream. 
football for me was something I wanted to do, and so I tried to take advantage of that opportunity by doing the only thing I knew how to do, and that was to work hard so that sometime in the future, you didn't have to ask yourself, what if? Blyer's dedication paid off. By 1974, he was a starter alongside Franco Harris. What he lacked in speed, he made up for in heart. Rocky was slow, real slow. One of the stories that he shared with us is that he always wanted to be fast enough so that when he ran, his hair would blow in the wind. And one day, he had a breakaway. And he said he felt the wind blowing in his hair. Rocky Blyer's long, unlikely road through the NFL showed no signs of ending in 1978. Blyer scored a career-high six touchdowns, including the game winner in the final minutes against the Saints. Bradshaw's back. The rush is on. He has to unload it. He does to Blyer at the 19. Blyer to 15 to 10 to 5. Blyer going in for the touchdown. Oh, dependable Rocky Blyer. Age hadn't caught up with the 32-year-old Rocky Blyer or the Steelers. They were proving to be as good as ever. Basically, we like to pride ourselves on being a very fundamental football team. You have to win by blocking well and tackling well, out hitting your opponents. And uh, it takes special kinds of people to do that. And those special kinds of people are the ones we're looking for. And I think we have those kinds of people. The people the Steelers had were the best in the game. In 1978, 10 Steelers were named to the Pro Bowl. Of their 22 starters, nine were future Hall of Famers, each drafted by head coach Chuck Knoll. I don't think Chuck gets anywhere near the credit for the evaluation of talent and the orchestration of that talent on the field. He was tremendous. He was not a motivator, and I think that was actually one of the strengths of the team in that the players had to be self-motivated. There wasn't a false sense of enthusiasm. There had to be an inner fire on the guys, and I think that was evident all the way through the roster. I remember being on the sidelines with Chuck, and we're all talking, you know, and we got to support your teammates, you know, and you're going, come on, guys, come on, hit them, let's go, let's go, come on, let's pick it up. Let us stop them, D! And I can remember him turning around and saying, we don't have any of that here. We don't do that here. I mean, because only, that lasts only this long. Because when you're out there on the field, the thing that gets you through is the habits that you create. Is what you do in practice that carries on to the field. All that emotional stuff, the rah-rah stuff, doesn't win ball games. <laughs> You know, I, how I approach it really doesn't affect how the games turn out. Let me tell you that right now. I'll set the record straight on that because it happens uh, with the players on the field. He was a man of few words, but he could look at you and you knew kind of what he meant and what you needed to do. Our pregame motivation was, okay, we had a good week of work. You know what to do. Let's be professional. Go out and get them. Halftime. All right, we made our corrections. We went over it. You know what to do. Let's go out and play the second half. <laughs> that was it. Noel rarely deviated from his standard speeches. On a few occasions, he attempted to motivate his team by telling stories with little success. Gentlemen, he said, like the two squirrels, one lived high in the tree in the branches, and the other one lived on the bottom. And what we really have to do is uh, pull back together and go back to the basics and concentrate on good habits. And, and so I want you to think about that, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Oh, what happened to the squirrels? <laughs> I mean, and I'm sure the other guys are, what, what, what happened to the squirrels? <laughs>
He was the classic guy that couldn't tell a joke. I mean, even when he told a joke, you get to the punchline and you just look at him. <laughs> and I mean, it's almost like a little kid. You know, the only thing he didn't say was, do you get it? Do you get it? Noel was in no mood for jokes on a Monday night in week eight. Oilers rookie running back Earl Campbell ran over Pittsburgh for three touchdowns and dealt the Steelers their first loss of the season. In week 11, Pittsburgh lost again in Los Angeles. The Steelers were 9-2, and two, but their offense was struggling. What we really needed was somebody to put their boot right up our butts. I mean, that old-fashioned, yelling, screaming kind of an inspiration. But we have Chuck. And Chuck pulls us together and he said, Gentlemen, I'd like to tell you a story. About two monks. And they're on a journey. Sometime down the journey, they stopped in a clearing. And near the clearing was a stream, and the far side of the stream was a, a fair maiden who wanted to come across. And the first monk, without any hesitation, crossed that stream, picked up that fair maiden, forded her back, and set her down. And the two monks, in silence, continued on. Now, sometime further down the journey, they stopped again, and the second monk spun onto the first monk and said, you know, you know it's against our belief and our religion to one not only come into contact with a person of the opposite sex, but actually to speak to one. He said, you disregarded that back to when you, when you crossed that stream and picked up that fair maiden and forded her back and set her down. And the first monk responded to the second monk, I set her down back there, but you carried her all the way here. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Well, well, we broke up that huddle, saying to one another, what the hell did he say? And, and that was Chuck. You know? I mean, we're looking for somebody, actually, who, who, who's going to explain it to us. Nothing. It was dead silence. And we just figured, well, that's it. Noel was about as far from a Zen master as you could probably get. He was so serious all the time. I mean, it was miserable listening to Chuck talk. I mean, that was not his strength. But it wasn't a weakness either because of his fundamental mindset. We were amazingly well-schooled in the basics. If you did things exactly as he and the assistants drew it up, it was going to work, and it did. And uh, that's where the success came from. It, it didn't come from a, a bunch of uh, wild banshees flying all over the place with reckless abandon. It was a controlled machine, and uh, it was a great one. Here comes Terry Bradshaw now. Where's it? Terry, Terry, Terry. Good luck today, man. Hey, Franco. Watch yourself. See you later. Okay. Terry Bradshaw traveled a long road to success in the NFL. Steelers quarterback had endured years of struggle, booing from hometown fans, and a stormy relationship with his head coach. Bradshaw eventually matured into a championship quarterback. By 1978, the ninth year passer was in his prime. 1978, kind of dawns on him what he can and can do. He can read defenses. He knows what plays to call now. And he feels very confident, I think, in his own ability and his ability to be able to change whatever Chuck might want him to do. Bradshaw was one of the few quarterbacks who called his own plays. He did a masterful job of balancing his high-powered air attack with a steady dose of running plays. And Bradshaw on the draw gives it to Harris straight through the middle and into the end zone for a Pittsburgh touchdown. They were looking for the pass. Bradshaw called it perfectly, a draw play to Franco Harris. Terry did a good job in third down conversions, uh, running the football, throwing it, mixing it up, mixing his offense real well. So I've started going to more play action. Now I've got some confidence. And uh, today we threw on first down, we threw on third, we threw on second. We mixed it up, we ran on first, we just... Threw a lot of different stuff at him all the time. We trapped him sometimes and and just uh, used a lot of offense today. And we had success. 
everything Bradshaw called seemed to work. The quarterback was suddenly leading a charmed life on the field. Off it, he was making country music albums. And in 1978, he appeared in the movie Hooper with Burt Reynolds. Burt, if you're watching, talk to my agent about my next movie. <laughs> Make it a western. You gonna let me be in it? Yeah. <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers, <laughs> the <laughs> finest team around. When the weather gets cold, the black and gold are gonna be Super Bowl bound, 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 bound. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I guess that's one of the reasons why Terry is such a fun guy. He can really, really laugh at something, and he can really laugh at himself, too. Some people say that uh, football teams are like a family. Would you agree with that? Oh, I hate all these guys, and I don't enjoy them at all. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's true in a sense. We're, we're close. Heck, you're together six months a year. You're sleeping with one another. You shower together. You meet together all day long, and we got a beautiful family here. In the Steelers' family, the two star receivers were sibling rivals, vying for their quarterback's attention on and off the field. Brad was very good at playing both Swan and Stallworth against one another in kind of a joking way. One week he decided, I'm gonna just kind of hang out with Lynn just to see what John would say. And so he'd go over to Lynn, cross the locker room over the other side, just kind of hang around his locker, and then he'd come back and then Brad would giggle. <laughs> Terry is a scream. He played it, you know, to the hill. And all of a sudden, wherever he turns around, there's Lynn and there's John. He would, you know, out loud say something like, boy, I, I could really go for a donut. And all of a sudden, there's a dozen donuts there. So it was fun to watch, but it was obviously a great thing for the team, too. On a Monday night in week 13, Bradshaw hit Stallworth for one score and Swan for two others. The win snapped the Steelers out of their mid-season slump. The following week, Pittsburgh traveled to Houston for a rematch with the division rival Oilers. It was the second time the Steelers faced Earl Campbell, and the rookie Phenom got off to another fast start. Looked like he was about to have a good day. And Donnie caught him right in the ribs. When Donnie Shell hit you, you knew you'd been hit. That was a statement, and that kind of told you what that game was all about. Didn't want to see him get hurt, but first time in my entire career that I ever was glad to see someone leave the field. With Campbell out, Houston was helpless. Steelers improved to 12 and 2 and clinched their fifth straight division title. It was the first step towards another championship. I am hungry for another another uh, Super Bowl. We have a great opportunity here to do something no team has ever done. That's win three of them. This was Pittsburgh's time of year. In the Steelers' final regular season home game. Bradshaw threw for three more scores. He finished the year with a league-high 28 touchdown passes and was named the NFL's most valuable player. Bradshaw had survived his early career storms and had produced his best season. Now, he and the 14-2 Steelers were ready to conquer the postseason. We get on fire, we get confident, we get that fever, and... And we're hard to we're hard to play. We're hard. To, I'd hate to have to play against us. We're gonna be hard to beat. Hard to beat.
This is Myron Cope along with Jack Fleming bringing you the Steelers' first playoff battle against the Denver Broncos. The Steelers remind you of those 74 and 75 Super Bowl championship Steelers. They have that tough defense in this year, an extra dimension in the passing game. Terry Bradshaw, a great year. This year we've had a revival of the terrible towel. The terrible towel is poised to strike. So are the Steelers. The Steelers are so great, and they play the best of all to take our beats for to the Super Bowl. So Bradshaw's back need good protection. Going deep for Swan. There's Swan to catch it for the touchdown. After dominating Denver, Pittsburgh got an icy reception for Houston in the AFC Championship. The Oilers were a division rival on the rise, and they had already won in Pittsburgh earlier in the season. Whenever you're competing and somebody thinks that they're on your level, it's an incentive to prove to them that they are not. We just wanted to prove to them that they can't compete with us. I don't know if they had a chance. Earl Campbell, the rookie of the year who had run over the Steelers in week eight, was shut down in his return to Pittsburgh. Joe Green, Mel Blunt, and the defense punished Houston. Both teams were punished by the elements. Of all the games that I've played, that was the coldest. Anytime you hit the turf, you just got wet. And there was no way of getting rid of that wet, cold feeling. Steelers offense never got waterlogged. Terry Bradshaw and Rocky Blyer helped Pittsburgh build a 31-3 halftime lead. Rocky breaks the tackle, stumbles, comes over the right side, the 10, the 5, he's headed for the goal line, touchdown! Rocky Blyer on a slant up the right side. In the third quarter, Blyer began feeling effects of the weather. I was on the sidelines trying to get warm and I started to shiver. You know, how your jaw just starts to click back and forth and you have no control and you're just going and you can't get warm. Team doctor was standing there and doc says, well, I think maybe we should send you in. Well, outwardly I'm going, oh, no, no, no I, I can play the game. Inwardly I'm going, yeah, yes, I want to go in, I want to go in, I want to go in. So he said, okay, fine. I got to tell Chuck that I'm taking you in. And I'm going, oh, don't tell Chuck, don't tell Chuck. Let's just go in. Chuck's standing on the sidelines, and taps him on the shoulder. He said, uh, Chuck, I'm sending Blyer in. He goes, why? Well, he's cold. Oh, I could have died. But I get to go in. The Steelers that remained outside were soon warmed by thoughts of a trip to Miami for Super Bowl XIII. We got the best offense, the best defense, After a two-year absence from the Super Bowl, the Steelers were headed back. They once again had the look of a champion. Super Bowl XIII was a meeting of NFL superpowers. The Steelers had beaten Dallas three years earlier in Super Bowl X. Now, the Cowboys were defending champions. 
Dallas's sleek, sophisticated style was in direct contrast to that of the blue-collar Steelers. We didn't like each other. The Cowboys just had this mindset that almost like they were better than everybody else. You know, anytime you start proclaiming yourself as America's team, it was disrespectful to the rest of the league. The most disrespectful Cowboy that week was Thomas Hollywood Henderson. The linebacker had made headlines by questioning the intelligence of Terry Bradshaw. He took verbal shots at several other Steelers as well. His comments about me was that, you know, I was just a backup who didn't belong in the Super Bowl and basically was no good. And the only reason I was there is if, if somebody died or, or something. So I took it pretty personal. When somebody actually questions your ability as a player, I mean, that's a throwdown sort of event. So from my perspective, I, I was really looking forward to the game. Bradshaw, as usual, thrived under the big game pressure. Bradshaw loved to be in the limelight. It was almost as if when the lights went on, it was, it was showtime and, and he was ready to go. wouldn't come easy for Bradshaw and the Steelers. Super Bowl 13 turned into an epic back and forth struggle. One big play after another, produced by the game's biggest stars. I'll tell you, I, I, I'm out of breath because this is some kind of a Super Bowl. Staubach is back deep. And he winds up and throws, intercepted by Blunt at the 20. Bill Blunt came up with the interception. Hear that ball, get after their ass. Joe Green rode through to nail Starbuck and caused the fumble. Dog's gone, and Steve did have his mitts on that football, but he couldn't quite handle it. I think I played probably a quarter of that game being incoherent. They had this big guard. There was one play where he caught me on the chin with his helmet. I can't remember a whole lot after that. I was out. But I never left the game. It was a game no one would want to leave early, as each player seemed to stretch beyond his limits. Bradshaw rolling to the right. Thereafter, he throws on the move into the end zone. Conference touchdown to Rocky Blyer. As I was going up, thud. I mean, I felt this thud over my head into my hands, and I knew I had it. Great leaping fingertip catch by Rocky Blyer, who has never been known as a Vince It's like a three-second play. The Rocket can talk about that play for 30 minutes. People didn't think I could jump that high. As I like to tell people, I don't know, it was 18, 19, 20 feet. <laughs> so. I'm so sick of this Rocky Flyer and <clears throat> skying to get this ball. The guy who took the picture is sitting on the ground. And he's got the camera pointed up. I think Rocky was about four inches off the ground. But it was a good catch. <laughs> you might go back and look at Super Bowls over the years. They won't find a better first half than this one. The second half was equally dramatic and even more emotional. Thomas Henderson came in to nail Terry Bradshaw. It was whistle dead. When Thomas Henderson hit Bradshaw after the whistle, running back Franco Harris came to his quarterback's defense. It gets in Franco's face, and Franco responds. Well, Franco's a very easygoing guy. He doesn't say a lot. 
and he comes back into the huddle, and this is the first time I've ever heard Franco really say anything. He's got this look on his face, and all he says is, give me the ball. Harry Bradshaw, give me the ball to Franco through the middle, down over the 15 to 10 to 5, touchdown Pittsburgh. And the big guy went straight ahead through the hole. Boom! I mean, he, I mean, he hits that hole before anybody reacts and we score. Pittsburgh's next possession, Bradshaw completed his fourth touchdown pass. It was the first time Bradshaw ever threw for more than 300 yards. And he was named the game's most valuable player. Super Bowl 13, captured by the Pittsburgh Steelers. The first team in the history of the NFL to win it three times. An incredible season. Some teams you see, they celebrate and they're shaking champagne and spraying champagne all over each other. We never did that. I think the you know, ball club as a whole played well. Uh, My feeling was that we won the Super Bowl. That's what we're supposed to do. I guess it was just a different mindset of the team. None of the Super Bowl wins felt like conclusions, like it was the end. It was just another point on the path. Uh, you know, I, I said one thing about uh, to our football team after the game, and I sincerely believe it. I don't think we've peaked yet. And uh, we're looking forward to even bigger and better things. Yeah. Congratulations. The following year, the Steelers would win a fourth Super Bowl title. I consider myself very, very lucky and blessed. When I got into business, I wanted to be a part of the best team and to win. The motivation was always Super Bowl. More proud of this team than perhaps other ones? As proud. As proud. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jim. Whether they were Hall of Famers or role players, every Steeler shared the same drive to be a champion. I mean, it's almost like it was a wrinkle in time. It almost gives me the shivers thinking about it. That that many good people came together at that point in time. I don't think there ever was, and I'm sure there never will be again, a team of that magnitude of, of quality people and, and athletes. That probably was the pinnacle of the 70s teams.